Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of our Let's Talk Climate Change series. It's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Juan Camilo Cardenas from Colombia. So he's come a long way and he's here with us at the annual graduate workshop that the university runs. And uh, since uh, I know of his work over a very long time, over close to 30 years now on uh, behavioral experiments on natural resource governance, on the commons and on multiple things related to sustainability, I thought we should grab you him for a chat. So Juan Camilo, welcome to the university. It's it's a pleasure to be here. It's always great to see you again, Hanini, and to be here at the university. This is a great place. Uh, I was uh, looking forward to come here a year ago, and because of COVID, uh, I couldn't come, and I had to cancel the travel at the last minute. But finally, we made it, and I'm very happy to be here. Happy to be at the Advanced Graduate Workshop. I think it's an amazing experience. Uh, what what I have been. Uh, interacting with with the students, with grad students from all over the world. Uh, this is a great thing that is happening here. So thank you for having me. No, I'm great. I'm so glad that you could come. I'd like to start, if you don't mind, by asking you a little bit about your early childhood. Were you interested in natural resources systems for the, from the start or issues of sustainability or people getting together? What what brought you here? That's that's a, that's a good question. I, I, I've never thought about what happened in the childhood that connected me to this. Uh, my childhood was a very normal um, kid in the urban areas in a big city like Bogota, which is now like about 10 million people mm-hmm. all together. And normal life, uh, cycling was always my my thing. I would only worry about riding a bicycle in the streets. Not major connection with nature from families. And uh, we rarely would go to, you would say, the countryside. But then that turned into going into college and then from college going into grad school, becoming more and more interested in rural issues. Um, And I began to work uh, right after graduating from from college to to, uh, visit some regions in small farming communities and, and began to be interested in development and rural development and then from that into the environment. And then from that, interested in economics. Uh, I wasn't trained initially in economics, but in engineering. Uh, and I was a little bit frustrated from the engineering side, but I was excited to see that economists had uh, much to say. They had strong uh, theoretical frameworks to try to explain the world. Some of them now we realize are wrong. Uh, but at the same time, it was exciting to see how come economists were so powerful in societies. They are highly praise. They are highly, probably too much uh, consulted on. And and that was exciting to see, okay, maybe there's something in economics. And because I wanted to do environmental economics, I ended up in grad school doing environmental and natural resource economics. Um, And after all these years of trying to think about those models and think about how they um, explain or not the real world, that has been fascinating. And I'm still today excited because there are so many things we still need to explain so that we can get the economics of the environment and the behavioral sciences explaining the real world, but not only explaining, but trying to intervene in that real world with better tools, better models, better um, interactive uh, spaces with communities that I have been working with, uh, with the idea that that can become a space for, for social change. And then, so that, I mean, I'm just thinking back to the way I did. So I did my undergraduate uh, degree in microbiology, chemistry, and zoology, three majors, which have nothing to do with what I'm doing today. Yeah. And then a master's in molecular biology, but I got frustrated like you, I think, with the engineering, yeah. thinking that what I'm doing is not relevant to anything societal. And then I moved to ecology and from ecology to working on the commons because a study of remote sensing and ecology, which is what I was doing, is helps you map changes, but not understand why the changes are happening, right. which is human. Right. It's the mechanism. It's the mechanisms. Yeah. So, I'm, and from that, I wanted to ask you, we were having this very interesting conversation just before the cameras rolled on interdisciplinarity yeah. for education. Yeah. How is the Colombian in education system? You also ex- have a lot of experience with the U.S. educational system. Yeah. Uh, what do you feel in terms of interdisciplinarity to teach young people about challenges of the environment? Are we going where we should? Should we do anything different? Yeah, I, I have the feeling that the primary and secondary education are moving faster than higher education. 
I think the higher education system is a very slow moving yes. system. Very trapped in it. Very trapped in, in, in its tradition. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 800 years of university life uh, where the communities, the scientific communities by disciplines, I mean, we have been through this at least for three, 400 mm -hmm. years of maintaining a system of compartments by disciplines. It's not an easy thing to change. Whereas uh, the tertiary, uh, secondary education and primary education are moving faster. High schools are moving faster. Primary schools are moving faster. So there's a contention there. So the students, the young students come to the university and I think they're better prepared than the university faculty to do the <laughs> transition. So to me, it's harder to convince colleagues to move into interdisciplinarity than to convince the younger kids that this is what we need to do. And it's a challenge. We have invested a lot over these hundreds of years on building the communities within the disciplines. And that's hard to change, but we need to change it. There, there are so many reasons of why we need to change it. One of the interesting things that I think is happening in higher education is the challenge to move towards a problem-based learning, the PBL approach. Ah, right. And in primary and secondary uh, education, this has been happening for decades, yeah. for decades. Uh, you and I have kids and all our kids went through that in, yeah. in, in primary and secondary yeah. school. Yes. And it's been implemented there and they come with the idea that here's a challenge, here's a problem yeah. and bringing the different tools and put them together. Uh, in the university setting, it is harder to get PBL, to get the problem-based yeah. learning. Interdisciplinary work, transdisciplinary work is absolutely essential to do this type of problem solving. Um, and again, I think the kids are better prepared than the faculty, yeah. but we need to do the transition. I know there's the status quo bias. Uh, we have invested a lot as, as uh, commu academic communities, but we need to move towards that uh, because the challenges need that. And the challenges we have from climate change to bio biodiversity loss to the extreme inequalities in some parts of the world require that. Absolutely. And that actually brings me to the workshop, which is what connects us. So uh -huh. uh, for those who don't know and the readers, here, uh, the listeners here, the workshop is something that Eleanor Rostrom and her husband Vincent Rostrom set up at Indiana University. I think you left in June 2000. I joined the workshop in September 2000. And we always constantly heard of each other. Yeah. because. Uh, but the workshop was a very interesting experiment in a traditional university setting of Indiana University because both uh, Lynn and Vincent talked about the crafting of the course, yes, right? And it's not... It, Transdisciplinarity, as you were saying, you know, it's not just the, the social science and the science, but it's the crafting of the commons, which is the experiential setting. And what I've always heard about, and what I'd like you to tell us a little bit about, is the fact that you were one of the pioneers in taking the experimental games that they developed on, on the commons uh, to actual real life settings, right? Out with fishers and other kinds of uh, people, real life, not, not in the lab. So maybe could you just first tell listeners what behavioral games are and why they're so important for us? And so I'm going to connect the two points. Yes, because it, I think it has to do with the with the workshop idea and this crafting of methodological tools. Mm -hmm. So my lecture yesterday ended with a quote from Lynn and Vincent about the history of the workshop and this crafting idea that at the end they always thought about the word workshop because they thought that this was a place in which different dif different disciplines, different tools. I mean, your paper would lean on the different methods to think about the forest from the air on the ground. And, and that's an example of that. Uh, but also the idea that each problem may require different tools. So in a workshop, you have the walls filled with tools, but it's the specific task that says, okay, for this case, we may need this discipline or this tool and we need to work together on that. So not surprisingly, the last book that Lynn published was titled Working Together. And it was working together in terms of working together. And I see it that way with different disciplines, with different tools, or with the same communities that you're interacting with. And that has to do then with the point that, I, that, I, that you were asking, mentioning second, which is my, my own work. In the same way that I was uncomfortable and wanted to enter into studying the environment and I, I wasn't comfortable with the conventional tools that I was finding in economics and in other disciplines. When I entered the study of the commons, and this is the mid-90s, uh, governing the commons was already in there. But then came in 1994, uh, the book by, by Lynn Ostrom and Roy Garner and Jimmy Walker, 
rules, games, and common pool resources, which is their attempt to take many things from growing the commons into the lab. Yeah. But this lab idea was a number of students in college settings from industrialized Western populations, what, what now it's being labeled weird population, Western educated, industrialized <laughs> uh, educated uh, democracies. So it is very uh, narrow demographic. So when I began to think about my dissertation work, I began to wonder, I don't see why these students in U.S. colleges are going to know about sharing a commons. The, 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 the difficulties in dealing with the daily life of dealing with neighbors and communities and organizations and the ecosystem, the natural ecosystem and the rules of the game. But at the same time, this is fascinating because this is an idea of, okay, let's ask actual humans how they behave instead of thinking how in abstract, <laughs> yes, the homo economicus model in economics is supposed to predict what people should do. Uh, let's call maximizing utility yes. subject to a constraint. So it was fascinated by that. And I began to wonder, maybe we could do this in the field. Maybe we can try, but we need to translate that. And this is the crafting part mm. of the workshop. And this is before I had been into the workshop. This is before I had met uh, Lynn Ostrom and, and, and her colleagues there. But I was intrigued about how can we adapt or translate the conventional games that are running college laboratory settings uh, with computer screens and cubicles and all these college students. Can we translate these tools? And when I say translate is take them back from the computer to paper and pencil. Uh, simplify the language of the instructions, uh, have other ways of getting ready to invite a number of people in a community and say, we're going to play this game. This game is going to have actual payoffs, incentives. Uh, we want to incentivize this so that you can think about the problem, but also be aware that your decisions are going to affect others and others' decisions are going to affect you which is precisely what happens in the commons. We are all connected and interdependent. So I began to test that idea and that's what my <laughs> station was all about. So I began to do these experiments <clears throat> by the late 1990s. And then in 1999, uh, Lynn Ostrom came to UMass uh, to give a lecture. And one of my advisors, Sam Boltz, told me, Juan Camilo, don't tell anyone, but I am going to set up lunch so you take Lynn Ostrom to the faculty club by yourself <laughs> and nobody else is going to come and you're going to tell her about your experience. So you can imagine me going with the person that I was citing the most in my dissertation, uh, all nervous to tell her about the field work that I ju had just recently finished and beginning to write the papers. And she got very excited. But you know Lynn, she gets excited <laughs> with every new thing. She hears about game theory and gets excited and gets into it. Yeah. She's fascinated with GIS yes. and satellite imagery and she gets into it. So she, she began to wonder, wow, this thing about getting these lab experiments into the field and she had done experiments in the lab. So she got very excited and she ended up inviting me to, to Bloomington and that's how I ended up spending a year there. And we wrote a few papers with her and we began to continue extending this idea of the crafting. And 25 years later of doing all these experiments, it's still the crafting challenge. Every new problem requires, let's think about this, but we need to adapt the tool to this. Right. It's not only or just translating, a transporting without translating yeah. or transporting without adapting. If we think of these tools as templates that we just apply them over and over and over, I think it's problematic. Notice, Experimental sciences by default, and you know about experiments in the biological sciences, replication is key, right? Yes. So you have to have a protocol that you need to replicate. But at the same time, the reality is very complex. So there's this balance between maintaining replicability in the experiments, but at the same time, adaptability yeah. to the context. To me, that's a crafting process. That's a crafting process. Each new project, each new question, each new community requires this balancing between replicability to learn about the experimental approach, but at the same time, the adaptability to the reality. And the way of interpreting, right? Because some, to understand a place or a context, you need to know that place and context, I think, intimately. Yeah. But what working at the workshop taught me is sometimes to understand your place, you need to compare it with another place. Yeah. 
Because only by the comparison do you understand what is picking. And that's also crafting. Yeah, that's, that's also crafting. Yeah. I, I entirely agree. I mean, the idea of comparative politics, comparative political yeah. science, which is a lot of what, what influenced also the, the workshop, has to do exactly with yeah. that. But also the, the projects that had to do with the workshop, I mean, the, the, the E3 project in terms of the forests around the world. Yeah. There was replicability, but there was also comparison. Yeah, that is it. All these forests around the world, how can you compare one to another using certain tools, but understanding the, the local context is, is, is challenging. And which is why I love the, the use of the phrase that Lynn used, which are not, uh, um, you know, rules, like behavioral economics are rules, but design principles, exactly. which is from craft. Exactly. I mean, you can't say for sure that if you design it this way, then these are the outcomes, yeah. but you can exactly. assume to some extent. Yeah. So they're design principles. They're not, they're not rules. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, one of the projects that we did in the Amazon uh, with indigenous communities uh, a few years ago, it's an interesting case of exactly that. Uh, in this project, there's an indigenous community uh, or, or a group of indigenous communities in an in, in indigenous reserve in the Amazon. And the leadership of the community requested us to apply these tools to come there as a way of triggering a discussion within the community on some challenges that they were having. Mm. So we all have this idea that the Amazon indigenous communities are the perfect conservationist organizations, right? That they are saving the world for us, that they are saving the Amazon for us. But they have their own challenges. Yeah. So what happened was that I did these games with them and then I took Lynn's eight principles. And this is why the word principle is so key. And I said, let's do this exercise. You are going to discuss among yourselves each of the eight principles and then I'm going to tally among the leadership and the participants there, we have like 40 people from represented from the communities. You're going to judge yourselves, not me as an observer. You are going to discuss if you think that each of the eight principles is working or not in here within this community, in this vast territory of the Amazon jungle. Mm. And it was fascinating because the, they were always discussing with each other and ending up into a self-critical uh, view of what they were facing these days and they ended up agreeing on certain principles that they knew that they were not good at. So monitoring and sanctioning, which we know it works, we know in the lab it works, in the field it works, they said we have a serious problem here with monitoring and sanctioning. But this was all out of triggering with the games and what was happening there, the idea that these uh, principles are key. And then it wasn't at all about, okay, you external observers or academics or policymakers come and give us the rules. No, it's not about the yeah. imposition of rules. We know about that. But seeing it there in the ground, in their own discussion, thinking about principles as a way of creating the discussion and, 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 the, and the awareness within the community of the challenges they had, it was really, really interesting. Which is one of the design principles, right? That you have to be responsible for crafting your own rules. Someone else exactly. has less rules, exactly. you're not going to do it. And, and notice, in this case, they invited me just to bring the tools for the self-reflection process. Right. Not to impose rules. Not to say, okay, after doing these games, we external observers have this information and now we think that mm -hmm. this top-down solution of imposing rule A and B and C. No, that's not the way it works. Uh, but in this case, it was requested by them and it was a self-reflection process of the community. So if you think back to then all of your work in, well, of course, in Colombia, but in different parts of the global south and especially in different parts of Latin America no. and your work in the global north, no. what do you think of this reflection? Is? I mean, and coming back to the idea of the best rules are not imposed. And so no. often the best rules on the communities which we think are the best are imposed from, let's say, World Bank or ADB or the funding agencies or, and usually which come from well-intentioned but unfortunate accidents that start with academics working in the global north. Yeah. So what do you feel, looking back on all of this, if you had to talk to young researchers working in the global south or on the global south in their own context, what would you tell them? Yeah. What are the big un unanswered questions? How should And how should they be? You know, yeah. Really what you're saying is you should think politically differently about yeah. what you do. I think there, there are some uh, suggestions uh, maybe out of, the, the, the challenges that we have faced in the recent decades about this, but also some hopeful messages. I think there are things happening that are interesting. One of them, 
South-South dialogues are improving, yeah. are growing. Uh, we are better connected. Uh, probably you and I were among the the generations that still depended a lot on the north yes. north south relationships you and i decided to come back to our countries and try to do academic work there and some of our colleagues ended up remaining in the global north and we depending in building an international community on the north south yes. uh, connections and networks mm -hmm. i i think we still need that i think it's important but in a different way i think now there's more horizontal dialogue in terms of the north-south connections. Uh, I think that in the global north, uh, academia is paying attention to um, the global south academic uh, happenings. Yeah. But now also the south-south yeah. is so important. Uh, it is still very expensive. It is still very expensive to travel from South America to India to Africa. Uh, and it is less expensive to travel uh, north, south, uh, in that uh, way. Yeah. And for academia, that's a challenge yes. because we need resources for yes. this. But at the same time, through communications and Zoom and, and other ways, we can establish better and better links. So for young researchers, I would say, uh, try to nourish, try to, to cultivate. Uh, yes, continue with the north-south connections, but try to cultivate more south-south uh, connections. I think the, the the possibility of enriching that is going to contribute more to a more balanced world in the policy making, in the academia, uh, and, and and the building of shared knowledge of this kind. And that to me is so important. Having said that, it is also frustrating that the political economy of the global challenges is still yeah. the biggest challenge. The political economy of climate change continues to be what is going to happen in the decision-making mm. table of the top big players. Now, that is a little bit changing. I mean, India and China are huge players right now for climate change, right? And at least that is changing the balance of power with the, with the old unbalanced power from Europe and yes. North America. It is changing. But again, with these new players on the table, and, and for that matter, Russia and the Russian Federation as well, uh, these new powerful players in the climate change game are going to bring more complexity to this. Yes. And it's not an easy task. And I wonder, and, and this is something, you know, the Lynn Ostrom again in, in her latest couple of years was beginning to wonder about this. And, and she couldn't continue, but her mind was into this. Because it's not that easy to extrapolate from the local commons to these global yeah. commons. It's not easy uh, because of these issues, these political economy issues at these grand scales. Uh, so that's a challenging question. For young academics, definitely think about this. And think about this cultivating your south-south relationships and cultivate your north-south uh, relationships in, in academia, but in, in a more bilateral dialogue, in bidirectional dialogue. Uh, and I think we, we are doing better in that and we should nourish the younger generation of researchers to, to, to do this, exactly this. Absolutely. I think the AGW, for instance, which you're attending now is a great example. Yeah. I mean, you're coming here. Exactly. But I'm also very excited that now if you look at a lot of the global environmental change organizations, I remember 20 years ago, a lot of the discussions were at this meeting, you have to have scientists from the global north teaching young scientists from the global south. Yeah. And now that has changed. No, it is changing. I mean, AGW is a perfect example of what, I, what, yeah. what exactly what we're talking. And no, notice these South-South connections need, need to be uh, improved and, and, and we need to feed them with funding and connectivity and the like. And this is a perfect setting for this that. This is perfect. Yeah. Exactly. So I'll, I'll maybe wind up with one last question. You're giving a very fascinating talk today, which you were just telling me about. Yeah. Revolution, uh, why the nudge is not sufficient for revolution? Yeah. So the title of the talk comes from, from my Samuel Bowles lecture at UMass that I gave last uh, semester ago. And, and the title is The Revolution Will Not Be Nudged. And this is inspired by a, by a rap song, a, 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 an LP that was titled The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. And then there was a graffiti in the streets that said The Revolution Will Not Be Tweeted. Uh, so now we have into the nudging idea, yes. So, which is a, a, a very interesting and fascinating idea coming from behavioral yeah. sciences. And, and the nudge term that was coined by, by Rich Taylor and Cass Sunstein 
uh, brought the idea that you can nudge people to change their behavior. And if you aggregate with a sufficient number of people, you can have social change. And it has worked in some settings. So, for example, taxpayers are increasing voluntarily their, their compliance mm -hmm. with the tax code in certain countries by just sending certain messages without changing the tax code, right? So if you don't need to change the tax code, if you, need, you, you do not need to pass legislation, but you get citizens to do better in certain behavior, it sounds appealing. It sounds it really sounds interesting different. because the political costs are smaller yeah. and still you're getting change. But I want to question that and inspired by recent work by, by other colleagues in the profession, which is if we pay too much attention to the individual behavior, we may be missing or deviating our attention to the structural changes. And let me give you a very specific example, precisely by a study by George Lowenstein, one of the authors of one of these newer papers. And he did an experiment in which he gave people the opportunity to nudge uh, or to change their behavior thanks to a nudge to save more energy, mm -hmm. right? So you, you save some yeah. more energy, you turn off the lights, you do the right thing. Yeah. And then you feel good about it. And then they ask these people if they are in favor of a carbon tax. And they are less likely to be in favor of a carbon tax. And that's a perfect example. Of yes. So if we, with this nudging idea, make people sort of feel comfortable with the status quo, we may be missing the point of grand solutions like a carbon tax, which is a really important yeah. mechanism at this point at the global level. Yeah. That's a perfect example of my concern. So what I am trying to do is to think where is the link between the individual-based approach to change and the structural uh, approach to social change through changing the the big rules of the game or changing the individual behavior and in between what do we have communities and communities are the way to aggregate individual action create collective action and then push for legislative reforms that change the structure okay. and there are many examples in the world and in my lecture i will be talking about that so for example uh, women's vote rights mm -hmm. this started as a small groups of women getting together in certain parts of the world and saying this is unfair. We should get the right to vote. And they began to protest yes. in their own households and then in their neighborhoods and then aggregating. And this became a movement that eventually made universal vote for women, yeah. something accepted but changing the rules. Slavery took 100 years to end, but it started with a few movements of a smaller groups right. of people saying this is immoral. Right. Slavery is immoral. This should change. And then you begin to aggregate and all of a sudden you begin to have country by country, creating this snowball effect. Yes. And at the end, you get all countries abolishing well, slavery. Well, colonial regimes. Exactly. Uh, in forestry, you have, and, and this is a case that I am fascinated with and that I need to read more about, but the more I read about it, and this is in Africa, groups of women who were contesting the idea of these officers brought by British rule in Nigeria, yeah. and the British rule appointed men from the communities to be sort of like the representatives of the re British system. And women protested that because women were very important culturally in the political arena at the yeah. local level. And they began to create these movements to protest against these men who are their husbands yeah. 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 imposed by the British rule. And they ended up creating That's a revolution. It's called the Women's War. Yeah. And the Women's War in Nigeria in the mid-1800s ended up the British just dismantling the idea of this mechanism. So I am intrigued by this middle ground, which is the, the community level, how aggregating individual actions into collective action eventually pushes for reforms in the structural level. Very fascinating. If I think of that, I'm just thinking of, you know, some the work I've been looking at, the archival work in Bangalore. Uh -huh. There were women fighting for suffrage in Bangalore, talking to women in Sri Lanka, talking to women in Chennai, who were then talking to the ones in the UK and the US. Exactly. And exactly. exactly. That's, a, that's a perfect example because it starts from the ground. Yeah. It starts from these individuals upsetting, this unrest yeah. at the very local level. I mean, many of these major structural reforms didn't start from a wise person in the top who said we need to change the world yeah. this way and it's a top down thing. Yes. It's the pressure from the ground right. up. That's exactly what I'm trying to work on, on on this new research agenda. 
Thank you everyone for listening to one more episode of Let's Talk Climate Change. It's been such a pleasure to have Professor Juan Camilo Cardenas with us. And we hope you've enjoyed this conversation. We've talked about all kinds of things from interdisciplinarity in education on the on sustainability to issues of workshopping or crafting solutions to sustainability to why you need to do behavioral economics work in the lab and what can young people in the global south learn from south-south cooperations to work on the commons and work from, uh, I think, from individual solutions to nudging collectives or working with collectives to actually changing systems on, on uh, sustainability. So it was a great pleasure and uh, we look forward to having further conversations with you later. Thank you very much and thank you for having me and, and this has been a very rich conversation. Thank you. Thank you.